Welcome to Exploring Our World, Maps and Geospatial Science. Now before we embark on this journey, let's ask the following question. What is geospatial technology? Well, geospatial technology includes geographic information systems, remote sensing, global positioning systems, cartography, spatial analysis, and location-based services. Now, as you're reading through that list, it might seem that many, if not all of those names are foreign to you. But the fact of the matter is, you actually know more about geospatial technology already than you think. Geospatial technology is all around us. It's in our phones, in our cars, on the news, in the movies, and yes, even in our video games. For you fans out there of Wii Sports, here's a lovely picture of Woohoo Island. And for you fans of Grand Theft Auto, well, here's an image taken from Grand Theft Auto. And as you can see in these video games, they are completely different than Pac-Man and Pong and Tetris and Asteroids and all those cool games that I grew up with. Today's video games are founded in virtual reality. And when we talk in virtual reality, we're talking landscape, topography, maps, and really spatial awareness. Frankly, geospatial technology has almost become ordinary. Before we begin, let's take a quick look at some important and universal geographic concepts. How do we think geographically? How do we use mental maps and concept models to highlight the importance of asking geographic questions? Why is this important and how does it relate to geospatial technology? Let's take a look at mental models versus conceptual models. A mental model is an explanation of someone's thought process about how something works in the real world. It will evolve with experience. A conceptual model's primary objective, on the other hand, is to convey the fundamental principles and basic functionality of the system in which it represents. So what's the difference between the two? Well, a mental model is the representation that a person has in his or her mind about the object he or she is interacting with. A conceptual model is the actual model that is given to the person through the design and interface of the actual product. Ultimately, both types of modeling add to our understanding of place and help to form our decision making. This segues into mental maps. Mental maps are really maps of the environment stored in our brains that reflect the amount and the extent of geographic knowledge and spatial awareness that we possess or lack thereof. Now you'll notice I have my frowny face here and I apologize for that. But the fact of the matter is, we can turn that frown upside down with more experience. So our environment and our geographic knowledge of the environment and spatial awareness can increase with experience and with time. Here's a nice example of mental maps of Los Angeles, and I have three maps as an example here. First off, notice that all the maps share something in common. That is, north is up. So whatever mental map we do and whatever real map we have, we have to have certain standards. And in this regard, standards is north is up. We're going from simplicity toward complexity. In our first map, we have the Pacific Ocean bordered by Santa Monica. That's all we know is that Santa Monica relative to the Pacific Ocean in Southern California sort of looks like this. But as we get more complex, as we get more experience, we can start adding items to the map. So in our higher complexity map, we can now add land features. For example, here's UCLA. Here's LAX. Here's downtown. Here are the Santa Monica Mountains. And here's Highway 101. As we gain even more experience, we can now start adding more landmarks. For example, we have Staples Center and Dodger Stadium and the Coliseum to go along with the LA River. More freeway systems as well. So again, we increase our experience, we increase our understanding, and now we can increase our complexity of our mental maps. Again, in common, all maps are oriented so that north is up. 
Also in common, all but the first map identify some prominent feature and landmark because geographically speaking, that's sort of how we think. Wherever there's a geographic landmark or a prominent feature, we tend to remember that. Not common is one map highlights Staples Center, Dodger Stadium, and the Coliseum. Basically, again, we're moving from complexity to more complexity. You know, it's really interesting as I have two children, both are preteen, one is eight years old and the other is 12 years old. And I've made them a promise a couple of years ago that we will take our family and go to one Laker game per year. The Lakers play up in uh, Los Angeles at Staples Center. My children are huge Lakers fans, but it's incredibly expensive to go to a game. But I made them a promise, one game per year. Now, if I sat down and I gave a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper to each of my kids and I said, draw me a map of Los Angeles, front and center will be Staples Center. And in fact, the oldest kid might add some more stuff. He might actually add the Ritz-Carlton Hotel because the Ritz-Carlton is right next door to Staples Center. But if I said, boys, uh, draw me downtown Los Angeles, draw me the sidewalk where all those stars are, draw me the Chinese theater, draw me something other than Staples Center, they would have a really difficult time doing it. They are prominently thinking of a certain feature. That is their experience. Now my hope is over time, as we go up there, they'll start including more stuff in their map because what one includes and what one omits on the map, by choice or not, speaks volumes about one's geographical knowledge and spatial awareness. My kids right now are not aware. All they're aware of is getting to Staples Center, getting inside that arena, getting a hot dog or a slice of pizza, sitting down and saying hello to a Lakers player, right? Now the beauty is with them and with us, we can all increase our spatial awareness. And so over time, it'll change. And in a couple of years, I can say, okay, you kids, where's LAX? I can say, where is the Coliseum? I can say, where is Dodger Stadium? I can say, where is Groman's Chinese Theater? And by that time, as we continue to go on our journey, and I, as I continue to point out landmark and features, and they remember them, their mental map of Los Angeles will grow and grow and grow as their experience develops even further. So what are we really doing? We're really asking geographic questions. And the first is location. And when we discuss location, it's either absolute location or relative location. Location is going to answer the question of where. We look at region. Region is the portion of the Earth's surface with uniform characteristics. And we can study how they form and change over space and over time. And frankly, we can look at how they relate to other regions. We look at human-Earth relationship. Humans and the environment, such as resource exploitation, hazard perception, environmental modification. That is, how do humans affect the environment? And a couple of really big issues today are ozone depletion and climate change. And frankly, we really ought to take a look at this human-Earth relationship to see or to try our best to understand the extent to which humans are modifying the environment. We look at place, the characteristics that make each place unique. We look at movement. We're talking about movement of communication, movement of circulation in terms of people, airflow, water movement. All of this movement and diffusion across Earth's surface becomes a big player when we start talking about geographic questions. And finally, we take a look at relationships. What is the relationship between natural systems, geographic areas, society, cultural activities, and finally the interdependence of all of these variables over space and time? You know, one of the things we do in science, which is very, very important, is use something called the scientific method. Like all other sciences, geospatial professionals and ancillary users use the scientific method. And the method is based on observation, reasoning, hypotheses, and predictions to develop theories and to help solve problems. We collect data. We then 
try to come up with questions that we need answering and use that observational data to answer those questions. There's reasoning in scientific method. There's explanation and interpretation. We build useful models of real systems, conceptual models, numerical models also for prediction to try to explain the observation. We then create hypotheses. An hypothesis is a general statement summarizing the observed data and the model simulations. So we don't just make blanket statements. In the scientific method, there must be observation. There must be reasoning. And from the observation and reasoning, then we can create a hypothesis. And from that hypothesis, via experiments conducted, we can create predictions. And the more data gathered through observation and measurement, the more refined the hypothesis becomes, that could ultimately lead to theory. And a theory then becomes a real-world understanding of something, of an event. It's the knowledge of how things happen and behave as part of broad, general principles. So really, the scientific method is a continual, continual process of observing, asking questions, trying to answer them, collecting more data, trying to solve problems to the best of our ability. So when we talk about geospatial technologies, just like we talk about other sciences, the scientific method is going to be a prominent feature in our problem solving.